To start it off, thank you for inviting me to be here today to be your MC. I'm very honored, and it, uh, there's a lot of great speakers here today, so it's going to be a very interesting day. Um, we are going to have four speakers. <clears throat> the first two will be followed by a 15-minute break, and then the next two speakers will follow. And the first speaker up is Marlon Ferguson. I think everybody here knows Marlon and how fabulous she is, but I'm going to read out her bio anyway. She told me to shorten it, so I've not only not going to shorten it, but I've added a few things. <laughs> Just kidding. Marlon has been a supporter of the bereaved for over 30 years. Being the wife of now retired funeral director, she has trained with Delta Hospice, Lower Mainland Grief Recovery Program, St. Paul's Hospital Pastoral Bereavement Program, and has attended many workshops on children's grief, etc. She initiated a bereavement support group at Sacred Heart Church in Delta and was the coordinator of the BC Bereavement Helpline, developing bereavement support groups and training volunteers in the downtown east side and south Vancouver areas. In 2002, Marlon joined the staff at Valley View Funeral Home in Surrey as their Arbor Care Coordinator. Following the death of her 27-year-old son to homicide, she developed and facilitates an eight-week support group for homicide and suicide loss. Marlon is a board member of the BC Bereavement Helpline. She is also a support group facilitator, trainer, and was the first recipient of the Light of Hope Award, granted by the BC Police, the victim, BC Police Victim Services. Please come on up, Marlon. Good morning. Many of you probably know my story and, and know the story of, of our son's death, so I'm going to be very brief in, in telling that. In 2005, uh, our son trafficked uh, two bags full of cocaine, and I mean uh, suitcases, on a Greyhound bus to Ottawa. And when he got there, he decided he changed his mind and he left the bags on the bus. About two weeks later, he was ordered to go back and deal with where those bags were and, and they wanted to know what had happened to those drugs. Um, he flew back to Ottawa, stayed overnight, and uh, flew back to Vancouver the next day and didn't pick up the bags. The bags were in, a grey, in the Greyhound bus depot in the lost and found area. He flew back to uh, Ottawa the following day and stayed overnight again and was picked up by three men and kidnapped and taken to a warehouse in Montreal and kept there for six days. He was uh, stripped, beaten, tied to a chair, starved until the guys realized that the gang realized that maybe he was telling the truth and that these bags could be in the lost and found depot. Um, they took him back to Ottawa, and yes, they were there. Graham picked them up, and he collapsed on the street and died from a blood clot to his lungs. And we knew nothing of this at all. Our family were totally blown away and, and just didn't know any of those details of what was going on in our son's life. It took about uh, eight months before any people were arrested for Graham's death, and there were seven people involved in it, and they weren't all caught at the same time. So about 13 months after Graham died, um, four people had pled guilty to different uh, charges. Some were involved in the kidnapping, some were involved in the confinement of him, um, one had used his, stolen his bank card and, and had used that. So Delta Police, we, we live in Delta, Delta Police Victim Services asked us to think about writing an impact statement for the court. All along I had been writing down some of our feelings and, and uh, just the whole trauma of what was going on. And. Um, so to try and put that in paper for, a, for the court um, was very difficult. 
but I stuck with it and had tried to use as many adjectives as I could. And, and one of the things I did was I looked up the word impact and got some synonyms for that. And some of the synonyms for impact are crash, collision, shock, bang, force, and brunt. And I worked on those words to try and describe what trauma had happened to our family. These were the words I used when preparing and reading our impact statement to describe the harm that had been done to us when our son was murdered. The first time I read the impact statement was just prior to the four of the accused being sentenced. I wanted them to hear and to see just what their actions or lack of actions had done to us. I was very much in touch with our loss. I felt the power of these words. I felt powerful in describing all the harm that had been done to us. Even though we felt powerless, and we do when something like a murder happens in a family or even in a community, the powerlessness, like you, you just don't know where to turn, as, as many of you here know. But when I read that victim impact statement, there was power in voicing all those feelings that we had. I wasn't concerned or interested in what happened to the accused. I remember in the beginning when we first started to find out some of the information and people would say to us, oh, these guys need to be locked up forever. Or, Don't, you know, wish we had the death penalty back and the same thing should happen to them as what happened to Graham. And my husband and I never felt like that. We were not connected to the accused at all. I really didn't care what happened to them. I just wanted to know what had happened to our son. And I quickly realized that whatever sentence would be given to them wouldn't heal what was going on in us. Whether it was two years, 10 years, 15 years life, that, that we had to remove ourselves from that sentence. So I know when I read back in my first impact statements, and, and we've written a number of them now, um, they've changed. But I know the first one was all about the harm that these men had done to us. I wasn't interested at all in them. I was speaking for Graham, for my husband, our daughter and son-in-law, our extended family. I was speaking for the community. Graham was powerless in that warehouse. He was tied to a chair. I wanted him and us to get our power back. And the only way I felt we could do that was in letting them know what harm had been done to us. The offenders and the court needed to know what that suffering was about. The crash, the shock, the bang, how we had been forced into to bear the brunt of their actions. The judge in her summation before sentencing commented and used quotes from the impact statement to address the accused. I knew that she had read this statement, she had taken it to heart, and she was in touch with the deep loss that we felt. As you can imagine, with seven people being involved in Graham's death, we have experienced writing many victim impact statements, both for the court and for the parole hearings. In preparing for today, I looked over these impact statements and I realised just how much they have changed and how much I've changed. When I look at the statements for the parole hearing, I realise that they are more about the impact of Gra that it, Graham's death has been on the offender. And when Dave Gustafson, who's one of our speakers today, speaks, he'll talk about this. Just a few weeks ago, my husband and I and Dave met with two of the offenders, one in a jail and one in a halfway house in Montreal. 
But that's another story, and it's a powerful one too. Early on in this whole, probably within the first year, I was at church one day and the priest at our church gave a quote from St. Augustine. And that's kind of become my quote. St. Augustine said, Hope has two beautiful daughters, anger and courage, anger at the way things are and courage to change them. And, and I think the last almost 11 years now since her son died, I, I think being able to change how I feel, having the courage to be able to speak about it and to be able to support other people, um, that has definitely been a help. That's the impact that I want to um, have for me. I, I, want my, I wanted my power back those first years where we felt powerless, I, I wanted my power back and I knew I could get my power back with being able to talk about it and being able to talk about it to other survivors of homicide. Martin Luther King Jr. said, darkness doesn't drive out darkness, only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate, only love can do that. For through violence, you may murder a murderer, but you can't murder murder. Through violence, you may murder a liar, but you can't establish truth. Through violence, you may murder a hater, but you can't murder hate. Darkness cannot put out darkness, only light can do that. You can bomb the world to pieces, but you can't bomb the world to peace. And then being able to have my voice, being able to speak about our loss, being able to speak about the reconciliation that I have felt in, in three of the men that were involved in our son's death, peace has come. Thank you. Um, I was asked, am I able to speak about the reconciliation part of that? We met one of the offenders um, probably about four years after the event happened, and he was the youngest of the offenders. He was only 19 when it happened. And he was actually uh, a son of one of the other offenders. So my husband and I were very anxious to talk to him. First of all, because he was so young, and we felt that maybe he had a chance to change his life. And because he was, his father had been involved in the crime as well. So we met him, Dave Gustafson from the Community Justice Initiative, um, organized it all, and Dave came with us. Um, we spent about two hours talking to this young man. And, and initially, I think, it was to get more information about what had happened. Um, all of the offenders had pled guilty, so we didn't have a trial, thank God. But when you don't get a trial, you really don't, there's a lot of things that are missing in, in the events maybe leading up to it. So I think initially we wanted some information from this man that we, we didn't know. So he did, he answered a lot of our questions. He, he himself was, was terrified. He told us when he came in to the room, he said, I'm, I'm really scared. So we reassured him that we weren't there to take him out, that we were there just to talk to him, just to find out who his family were, how he grew up. We took with us pictures of our son and told him about our life as a family growing up and who Graham was. He shared a lot about his family. And, and we did, we came to that reconciliation. He apologized. He told us that he wanted to change his life around, that he was, he was a different person. He had a girlfriend. He, told, he talked a lot about his mother and that how his father had, was never there for the mother. Um, 
that he didn't want to let her down again. He spoke a lot about that. Um, sitting face to face with it, at that time now he was 22 or 23. Um, that was really tough because he's a young man, of course, a mother, your heart goes out to this young man. Even although he had played a huge part in the kidnapping and forcible confinement of her son, he didn't beat him, but he knew everything that had happened to him. Yeah, he, he asked for our forgiveness. We, we offered that to him and encouraged him to take all the programs that maybe were available to him in the jail, anti-violence programs or anger management programs, 12-step um, programs. And, and when we left, we hugged him, we cried, and uh, I wrote to him a few times while he was in, still in jail. We attended a couple of parole hearings for him too. And again, kept writing those encouragement letters to him. But we were able to forgive him and I heard um, remorse from him. When we met the other two men just recently in March, one, we met with his father, this young man's father, we met with him. We met with him one day and the second day we met with the, with the other offender and they were the key people involved in all of this. And um, again, we, we wanted, I think this time though it was different, it was more of what have they done in jail? What are their plans when they leave? Have they changed their life? Can they change their life around? That's, and, and with meeting with us, would that make a difference? Again, we heard some of the story, other things that we didn't know. We, I, I, we felt that we, that they were remorseful. They took total responsibility for what they did. And I, we needed to hear that. Again, we were able to forgive them. I think I already had though before even meeting them. Forgiveness is, is like just taking that weight off your back. You don't have to, I don't have to think about these men anymore. And I really don't. I know I've, I've let them go where before I thought about them every day and now I don't. I've been able to really reconnect with the restorative memories of our son and not just the events leading up to his death, thinking about him the desperation he must have been in, first of all, to traffic those drugs. And, and the desperation of those days back and forward on a plane to Ottawa, and then the days, six days, in a, in a warehouse, being tied, wondering what the heck was gonna happen to him next. I, I don't need to think about that anymore. I don't have to think about these offenders. I'm not responsible for them. Yeah, reconciliation definitely did come. And restoration came, I think, back into to our lives. I'm, I'm more connected to the restorative memories of our son. Yeah, I think we only got guidance in the, in the first, when we wrote the first one. I never asked for any guidance or help with, with other ones. But I think they changed when we wrote the victim impact statement for the parole board and it was more about the victim and less about the harm that they had done to us. I was more concerned about what they were doing, what programs they had taken, what steps they were going to take, what their life was going to be like. Could the community be safe if, if the offenders got out? My concern was more for the community and, and for their safety. You know, could they stay away from that life of crime? Um, the majority of them were, were young. There was, the eldest was 40. Uh, 
130, 127, and the rest were all in their early 20s. So there definitely was a concern for, these were all young men. The 40 year old had spent a long time in jail, in and out, right? So could he change? Could that change for him? So I think our victim impact statements were more of, you know, what could they do to change the life? My concern was for the community. I always find it amazing to hear you speak and it makes me think about the day-to-day -day things that we all go through and struggle with with forgiveness and to hear how you're able to forgive for for the uh, the loss of your son it never ceases to amaze me so thank you for for bringing that here today